Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da habti fillah We were last discussing some of the attributes and distinctions of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah as mentioned in the treaties and some of those unique qualities the Shaykh has some summarized them to 14 different attributes distinguishing Ahl Sunnah from Ahl Bid'ah Wal Ahwa. We mentioned the first uh, four I believe, the first one being they always adapt the middle way. So Ahl Sunnah is balanced. Secondly, they are contended with the Quran and the Sunnah only as a basis of all religious matters so that the Quran and the Sunnah is their masdar and the consensus, the fahim of the Salaf of this Ummah. Third, Ahl Sunnah have no leader except Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning that Ahl Sunnah is the most adherent to the creed and fiqh and menhaj or methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, <coughs> and that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the only one who was infallible. So meaning that we don't even take one of the companions and follow him in every single thing. We don't say, well, Umar did this, Ibn Umar did this, Mu'al did this, radiallahu ta'ala anhum ijma'een, and leave there. Because we take those things which are in agreement with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as Dalil for our understanding of Islam, we go back to the Quran and the Sunnah and the consensus or ijma of the ulama and the first of the jama'a and the first of the ulama is the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala ijma'een. So sometimes the sahaba perhaps differed on a mas'ala. Kathir, many issues in fiqh, for example, specific details or very very specific uh, issues that even had a relationship with creed, there may be a different goal from a Sahabi. Very intricate matters, not anything that has a, an effect on your general belief as far as uh, the Iman and Islam wa Ihsan. But as far as Masail Daqiq, and with this, <coughs> we take and we understand our Islam by what those things that, uh, by those issues, the companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, were united upon. So that's what we use as dalil, and that's where we return back to. The fourth issue, or characteristic, as mentioned, is that Ahl Sunnah completely abandons disputes in matters of religion and depart from such quarrelsome people. They abstain from quarreling and commenting based on their opinions in lawful and unlawful matters of the religion. They have completely entered in Islam. So that's a characteristic of Ahl Sunnah and may Allah bless us to be from them. Ameen. Because we fall short in many of these characteristics and may Allah bless us with tawfiq. So Ahl Sunnah they abandon disputing about uh, matters of the creed. That doesn't mean Ahl Sunnah totally abandons debating, no. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to uh, call to that which is better, invite to that which is better, uh, debate with them, so to speak, jadalahum billati hi asan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Wa Ta'ala commands us to use the Quran and the Sunnah as a hujjah, as dalil and evidence, to deal with falsehood, but not to spend our time and devote our time getting into disputes and arguments and debates. So if a person has knowledge of a particular issue in the deen, and someone makes a uh, makes a claim in front of you or disputes with you 
and you have the knowledge to remove that shubahat, that doubt, or dispel the myth or doubt or uh, mistake that is being uttered, then you should do so, because you have the knowledge and the ability to do so. But if you have some doubt about the issue yourself, or you're not clear, or your knowledge of it, or your knowledge of the adilla is not strong, then in those cases, sometimes it's better to leave off that. So the point is, is not to get into issues and debate. And one issue I would say, for example, getting in debates with the Ashadis. If you don't have the ability to do so, and even as a student of knowledge or even students of knowledge, they shouldn't go around just debating people about these issues and making this uh, uh, an issue that is something which is just constant. And it's a constant debate and dispute because this opens the door for the shaitan. However, if it comes necessary and the person, someone is making a false claim, maybe you come upon an ashadi and they're calling the youth to some of their falsehood, some of their battle about uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine characteristics and sifat. And you have knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sifat. Uh, in accordance with the Kitab in Lawa Sunnah to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the understanding of the Salaf, then for you to make bayan and clarify for them or to refute what this person is saying, then that becomes necessary. So the point being is not to engage in that. Don't invite those things. Don't immerse yourself in those things and those debates and so forth. They have conditions as well which this is not the time to go into the, the details of uh, Jidal and, and, and debating and argument, but we just want to take these general characteristics of Ahl Sunnah and try to apply them and understand them. Another characteristic the Sheikh mentioned, the Ahl Sunnah will Jama'at respect the pious predecessors wholeheartedly. Alhamdulillah. So Ahl Sunnah, as we mentioned, they believe that the methodology of the pious predecessors is much more saved, it is preserved from mistakes than other methodologies. Uh, and it is more correct and firm, consisting of more knowledge and wisdom. So that the the Sabil of Mu'mineen is the Sabil of Ahl Sunnati wa Jama'ah. The Sabil of Mu'mineen is the Sabil of the Salaf of Sari. And that their understanding, those things that they agreed upon, is the path, is the infallible path. And from our contemporary scholars, uh, Imam al-Albani had some beautiful, uh, a beautiful statement regarding this and many other mashayikh, but I recall, uh, given the general meaning, that the Imam said that this path is infallible. The path of Ahl Sunnah is infallible. So the path of the Salaf, because it's a path, it's a way, it's a minhaj, it's a methodology. However, you find individuals, you'll find, of course, individuals from the Salaf and people who adhere to the creed who make mistakes because no one is free from mistakes. What did the Prophet ﷺ say to affirm this for us? That even our ulama, no one is free from a mistake. We don't say, Sheikh so and so, you see, fi kullu mas'ala. We don't say, Sheikh so and so was correct in every single statement he said. He was always correct about his judgment about a so and so. He was always, la, we can't say that. We can't say that. No one is infallible. The Prophet ﷺ said, because this is nas, this is nasus, this is text, this is wahi, this is revelation. The Prophet ﷺ said, Adam khata All the children of Adam make mistakes, and the best of them are those who repent. Or all the children of Adam uh, have sins, and the best of those are those who repent. <laughs> Ahl Sunnah, they strictly oppose interpretations regarding the attributes of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving wrong meanings to the verses of the Holy Quran and authentic ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu And this is, goes back to what we're saying about the Ashadis and debating and stuff like this. They are quite obedient to the Islamic law, giving preference to textual proofs over the human intellect. Wherever they see any verse or authentic hadith, they don't see any room for interpretation and false thoughts meaning interpretation that goes outside the realm of the Sabil of the Salaf, how they understood those Nasus. Rather, they submit their intellect to the definite orders of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. <coughs> so, 
as we are all familiar with the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and it goes way before Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, the Ahl sunnah does not negate the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahl sunnah does not make uh, does not misinterpret the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in order to fit our, our limited intellect. Ahl sunnah does not uh, distort the meanings. Ahl sunnah does not change the alfav, the, the lev or the the pronunciations. We don't say like the Ashari say that istoa means istola. We don't say this. So Ahl sunnah, we go with what was affirmed as far as our understanding from the Nusus we take a more literal approach <clears throat> in that we look at the Nusus first and foremost through the little literal uh, in interpretation because this is the the benefit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it uh, easier for us to understand the book and the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that those things which are very clear and literal then we follow them in accordance with revelation and those things which are uh, not literal or that have a uh, a clear other meaning which is not the literal interpretation that means we have to have dalil for that from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and going back to the Arabic language and this is very important why the Arabic language is, is very invaluable with the Sharia because the Sharia was revealed in the Arabic language. We understand the Quran and the Sunnah because it was in the Arabic language and the Arabs had, a, had their pure understanding, even the Bedouins at their time, aside from their different um, dialects, but they had a pure fusha, a pure uh, language in which they understood those the, the meanings okay <coughs> and those things which they did not understand then they would ask the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about you know those terms new terms that came with the with the sharia or terms that had a different meaning that had a linguistic meaning which they understood and then had a sharia meaning so they would ask the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about these issues so this is how the development of those alfav and those terms in the Sharia came about, and why Ahl Sunnah we refer to uh, first and foremost the literal interpretation. And there's many many things we could say about this, but we want to stay on topic. So Ahl Sunnah also they assemble all textual proofs regarding any matter under consideration, rejecting the allegorical evidences with the explicit ones. So, for example, if uh, Ahl Sunnah uses the the nas, the nasus, the text, to understand other text, that to understand the interpretation of the Quran, we go to other verses of the Quran, and if we don't find it there, we go to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if we don't find it there. Uh, then you you go back to you go to those statements of the Sahaba, and if you don't find it there, you find it with the Tabi'een, and if you don't find it there, you find it with the Itba'a Tabi'een, and likewise uh, the Nasus they explain one another, and so we have a Sabil, we have a path for understanding Islam, and Ahl Sunnah uh, does not take those ayat those ayat that are ambiguous and build their their foundation of their religion but rather they go to the muhkamat those clear uh, ayats and so forth that have rulings and that are clear and uh, clear in their meaning and this is how they build their religion and they use those to explain the allegorical methodology so this comes down to a different interpretation with uh, from uh, groups like the Ashadis and Ahl Kalam because you'll find that a lot of them Basically, they're trying to, many of them, for example, the Ashadis and some of the other groups, the Jehemiah, perhaps, or the Mu'tazila, and some other groups, they're flying from one bid'ah. They're trying to flee from the bid'ah of making a resemblance between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the literalness of the verses in the Quran. They're trying to avoid that being literal because they are afraid of making a resemblance between the Creator and the creation, for example. When you say Ar Rahman Ar Ars Istawa, the most merciful rose above his throne. 
they say, well, we can't say this literally because we don't understand this literally. This has to mean because my intellect doesn't accept that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rolls above his throne because I rise from my chair or so-and-so uh, sits and there's a descends from the airplane or so forth. So they make a likeness with the nasus to what we understand in our intellect and then they begin to negate those very sifat, those very characteristics which are literally understood because we don't have other evidence to show us that they're not literal or that they're allegorical. <coughs> allegorical. And so they begin to distort because they're afraid of the tishbi. They're afraid of making the resemblance. Whereas Ahl Sunnah is la. We accept those nasus as they are uh, because Allah mentioned seven times in the Quran that he, he rolls above his throne. So we say he rolls above his throne, just like him. You can't go wrong if you say what the Creator said. And you use the alfad that are in the Quran and the Sunnah. If you're using the text and you're using the statements or using the terms that are used in the Quran and the Sunnah, you can't go wrong with that. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Yanzilu Rabbana Tabarak wa Ta'ala Kulu Thuluth Al-Layl Al-Akhir that our Lord descended to the last third, to the last, uh, uh, to the lowest heaven in the, in the last third of the night, every last third of the night. We say, the Prophet ﷺ said this, so we say that. We don't ask how, so we don't go into it, trying to explain what we don't know. We don't know the how. As Imam Malik said, when asked about uh, Estoa, he was asked in the Haram, and he said, uh, the, the man said, Ya Abu Abdullah, Kev Estoa. How did he ascend? How does he ascend? Kev Estoa. Imam Malik began to sweat profusely because he was so upset and, and disturbed by this question. Like, come on, Ahl al you're shaking me up. How dare you ask something? which is clear, we, we haven't heard this before, these kind of weird questions, what is going on? Because this is the effect of philosophy and the effect of a person thinking too much about things we don't know about. So then what did he, that great Imam say, Rahmatullah Alay, Rahmatullah Wasiyah, he said, Al-Istawa Ma'loom, Wa Kayf Majhul, Wa Su'al Anhu Bida, and another Ruwaya, Wa Anta Mubtadiya, or Kama Qad. So Imam Malik, he said, Estoa, or rising to rise, is, is known. Meaning we know this from the Arabic language. We know the meaning of what that means, to raise up. But how is unknown. We don't know how Allah does it. We don't ask, we don't go into those things because we don't know. We just go with the revelation. The revelation says this. We don't make those judgments in, in accordance to our intellect. Because if so, then we, according to our intellect, many things in the Sharia we would discard. Because it would be in accordance with our desires, in accordance with our intellect. But instead, Ahl Sunnah says, La, we're trying to stick with those Nasus because that is the maintenance of Islam. Islam was preserved in that manner. That is what we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. We don't believe that Allah wants us to change His laws and, and the rulings and the aqidah and the fiqh entirely throughout time. Oh, it's a new time. We don't need to believe in the malaika anymore. Oh, it's a new time. We don't, we don't have enough reports verified uh, that we've seen jinn or that we've seen malaika, so that must not be, uh, we, must, we need to reinterpret that. This is what some people have gotten to this extent of battle, this type of falsehood. And this all comes from pursuing the intellect over the nasus. That doesn't mean Ahl Sunnah doesn't think. Of course, Ahl Sunnah thinks and debates and looks into the meanings and strives and, and uses their intellect. But they don't take, give preference to their intellect over those texts of the Quran and the Sunnah. And I hope that's clear. Ahl Sunnah are the models for the pious ones seeking to be guided to the right path. This is the result of their firmness and truth, complete conformity with all the matters of Islamic monotheism, joining of knowledge with worship, appropriately merging between their means and complete trust in Allah. 
they merge between striving for their worldly provisions and abstinence in worldly respects. Merging between the fear of Allah and hope for His mercy, between loving and hating for His sake, they also merge between their politeness and mercy for the believers and harshness and anger with the disbelievers as well as their distinguishing qualities irrespective of the differences of their time. So these are all attributes of Ahl Sunnah that they <coughs> that they're models they should be models for the pious and this is one thing you get by sitting with the ulama and I would even say I don't know because I haven't I've sat with students of knowledge mainly in the Arab world and, and in other countries a little bit but mainly in Yemen and, and Saudi Arabia so I haven't sat with uh, students of knowledge in the West or in, in other places so I don't really know but what I, do, uh, you know, what the people gain as far as manners and stuff. Yes, there are brothers who have good manners and have studied and have knowledge. But what I will say is, is that the what you benefit from the ulama, especially those major scholars and those scholars who are known for their worship and known for their fearfulness, got their fearfulness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, that you 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 gain so much by just being in their company. And it really strengthens your Iman because you see how firm and how strong they are in propagating the, the Aqidah. Whereas you yourself might sometimes be weak. Not that they don't get weak too because they're, they're humans. But you see a difference, the strength in Ilm. And combined with Ibadah and worship, some of our Mashaykh that are well known in Medina, that are well known for their Ibadah, you, you see that. You see it exhibited in their, their attributes and how they, uh, even when you approach them and how they treat you and how you sit, you see see them in the in their durus, their love for Islam, their love for teaching, their love for going into books. They're spending all their time going into very daqiq messiah and very intricate, detailed issues. You know, this is how they spend their time. They devote their time to that. So you see that they have a love and a passion and a practice that goes along with it. So then, you know, that's a very beautiful thing that you gain from the ulama, from sitting with them. And I want to say something with regards to the statement the Sheikh mentioned about, uh, with, uh, with regards to Allah wa al uh, that does not mean that you don't, that because someone disbelieves in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you treat them bad. Or that you are harsh with them and this and that. No. How do you think someone would become as Muslim if you were treating them and you were harming them? So this is a misconception that people have to know how to understand these principles and put them in their proper context. That some of the readings and writings that we read about various topics, they're in a context in a particular society on how they practice. But we go back to the Asalas, the Nasus. We see the Prophet ﷺ visited a Jewish boy. We see the Prophet ﷺ who was sick. He didn't say, oh, that's a Yahud. He's this. His nose is like this. And he's like, you know, he didn't come with racist stuff. He didn't come with, no. But he visited him and the boy became Muslim at the request of his father. You know, Abu Huraira, his mother, he treated his mother and the Prophet ﷺ supplicated for her as a non-Muslim and she became a believer. How many of the... Our, our mutaqaddimin, they were non-Muslim from the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala and majma'in, and then they became believers. Why? Because there was good treatment with them. They were treated well. They were respected as human beings. And these are attributes of Ahl Sunnah. This is what we need and what we need to be propagating, especially for us who live in the West. It's very important that we understand on how to, uh, uh, how, how we uh, deal with the society that we're involved with because we don't live in a uh, right now I'm in Saudi Arabia everything you know Muslims are uh, 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 you know it's a Muslim society majority Muslims uh, everything the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are here meaning the the, the 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 Sharia and things like this it's all around us and we have the upper hand in, in totality so there's a different way. You don't. You may not even come. You may live in a place here where you don't even come in contact with non-Muslims. But when you go back to your societies, for us who live in mixed societies, 
or that we're in which we're the minority, we see a whole different reality, a whole different reality. All of our neighbors might be non-Muslim. So how do you deal with that? Our parents, our whole families might be non-Muslim. How do you deal? How do you cooperate with them? How do you operate with them? You have to know and understand these things. And going back to the Asus, the Prophet was the was a Rahmah for, for, for mankind. And if you show your Islam, you show the people, then the people will either, one of two things, either they'll become Muslim or they will uh, be influenced in a positive way and have something good to say about a Muslim. So these are some important things in which we have to consider. Another characteristic of Ahl Sunnah is Ahl Sunnah do not take for themselves uh, names other than Islam, Sunnah, and Jama'ah. This meaning that Ahl Sunnah does not adhere to a particular group, that hey, we're now uh, a group called Boko Haram, or we're Akhwana Muslimin, or we're Jama'at Tabliq. Or where Jamaat so and so, where Jamaat Abdul Qadir Sayyid uh, uh, Jilani, where on the tariq uh, of uh, this one or that one. But rather, Ahl Sunnah takes those names which are mishroor, which are legislated, which come from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the consensus and the people of the Sunnah in the past. And we'll get to that uh, a little bit more extensively uh, very shortly. Ahl Sunnah, they have a desire for the spread of the true creed in the religion, and teaching and learning is indeed intense. They seek to guide the people towards these things, advising them, helping them manage matters related to these. So, Ahl Sunnah, they use their time devoted to knowledge and spreading da'wah. That even time, look at the time we live in in Fitna now. Great fitna. We have Syria. Just Syria is 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 a is a fitna. Is a disaster. Iraq. They have not had uh, any form of peace and and tranquility and since they were initially invaded by America and prior to that or definitely after that. You know, it's been destabilized. It's been destabilized completely when uh, Saddam Hussein was removed. Even if he was a wicked shaitan and a tyrant and a devil and a, a, a disbelieving devil. There was still stability in the society. People could buy bread and have schools. Not that they can't now, but here you have people doing suicide bombs during football matches. Uh, you know, the sectarian war that's raging there, it's, it's just out of control. And people are doing the most wicked and evil uh, things to one another. And Syria, we don't even have to mention how all the things that are going on there. And with all this fitna and destruction, we see that Ahl Sunnah, the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, they deal with those issues, but they also maintain they're still teaching. They're still teaching in their localities, even in the places where there is war and fitna. You have Ahl Sunnah on the same minhaj. Now there's a time, obviously, to go forth, and there's a time uh, to teach, and there's a time for everything. But you see that Ahl Sunnah still makes da'wah. And the, the, the best example I can think of, especially in contemporary times that we can be familiar with, is what's going on in Yemen right now. Yemen right now is basically in a civil war, is broke down. Uh, you have Shia Houthis supported by Iran, uh, you know, doing, uh, uh, you know, trying to take over the country and so forth and fighting. And then they're being bombed by the, the coalition. The people are going through all kind of destruction and dying. The death toll is rising. The instability, the prices are up, inflation, all the, the things in the society. But you find that many of the Mashayikh, the, the Marak is the Sunnah in Yemen, they're still going. All of them are still going and teaching. If you go to Hudaydah, you go to Sana'a, you go to, uh, 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 um, to Aden, Fiyush, you go to Hadramo, to Sheher, Dar Hadith here, wherever Dar Hadith, they're still going and they're going forward. Those are still putting out Mahadra, talking about Taqwa, talking about everything, talking about their, their situation, but also teaching the people. They're still preparing the people because this teaching, Abu Sunnah, believes, as Imam al Albani articulated, in Tarbiyah wa Tasfiyah. 
in that, that through education, Islamic education, and purification through ibadah, that this is how you raise the whole society. This is how you raise your future. That it's not by just quickly running here, quickly getting upset here, a protest here, a this, that, you know, all these other activities, <clears throat> but rather, it's a long-term solution. And it's a patient solution. Because a lot of times we have a knee-jerk reaction about a new fitna, a new trial, a new tribulation that we face, but all of a sudden they keep teaching and they keep going on that same, it's like the tortoise and the hare, but all of a sudden we'll get to the natija. But those hairs, you see that a lot of times they don't, they just disappear. They just made history. They were destroyed and they did this. They had a new way. They Instead of taking and working on themselves and working on their society and focusing on dawah, making, giving that precedence, not meaning ignoring the other aspects of the religion. It's not what we're saying. But we're saying they give that precedence most of the time. And this is what raises up. This is how you reach the people around the world and you help to raise better believers. Ahlul Sunnah are the most patient in respect of the troubles they have to face regarding their dawah and creed. The 12th point he mentions, Ahlul Sunnah, they are also very eager to be counted among the group of believers, al jamaah the group mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, and to invite and encourage the people to it. These people of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah are also very eager to enlighten the people to discard sectarianism, warning people against such. So Ahlul Sunnah warns against Bid'ah and Ahlul Bid'ah. Ahlul Sunnah invites the people to the Jama'ah. Ahlul Sunnah strives to adhere to the Jama'ah. Ahlul Sunnah distinguishes between truth and falsehood because they follow the ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa atasimu bi habli lai jami'an wa la and hold all of you steadfast to the rope of the law, and do not divide. So they're trying to hold to the rope of the law, but what are they doing? They're holding to the rope of the law, the book and the sunnah, and they're not dividing. But they divide and separate from Ahl Bid'ah, from those people who don't hold to the rope of Allah, and the sunnah, the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's wajib, it's obligation for them to distinguish themselves and separate from that. This is the whole aspect, whereas you have some other groups Especially uh, groups like Akhwan and Muslimin, their whole minhaj, their whole methodology is that they just want anyone who associates as a Muslim under one umbrella. We all want this. But we say, Ahlul Sunnah says, that this umbrella must be Kitab Allah wa Sunnah to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the understanding of the Salaf. The other ones say, well, no, we'll just uh, unite and cooperate on those things we agree to. And those things we disagree will excuse one another. So Ahlul Sunnah says, La, no, we have to call you and have to command the good and forbid the evil on those things that are wrong and incorrect. We can't unite on that. We can't unite Ahl Tawheed with the people who worship graves. We can't unite Ahl Tawheed with the people who make takfir of, of, of the leaders and who people who make takfir of the Muslims for the major sins. We can't unite Ahl Sunnah with the people whose whole minhaj, they have no vision about Islam or the future, but they have their new type of what they call jihad, a new distorted version of jihad where the individual uh, can conduct it anywhere, in any place, and, and say that it's in the name of Islam, when in fact it's, a name, it's in the name of terror, it's in the name of evil, it's in the name of wickedness, it's in the way of the Hizb al-Shaytan. Al-Sunnah can't unite on that. We can't get down, our program is not with those people. Ahlul Sunnah in general, that doesn't mean every individual, so we gotta understand this. Ahlul Sunnah have been saved by a law from declaring this is about the issue of takfir. Ahlul Sunnah has been saved by a law from declaring each other as infidels judging people based on the knowledge and justice. So Ahlul Sunnah does not, uh, is not extreme and, and delving into the issue of takfir. They make takfir where it is necessary because it's a part of the religion. No one can say that it's not a part of the religion. However, it has the wabit, it has criterion, it has shurut, it has conditions, it has mu'ana, it has things which prohibit from making takfir. This is the point. <clears throat> and Ahlul Sunnah, they, they, 
they, they practice those principles. Likewise, with the issue of tabdir, of calling someone an innovator. Ahl Sunnah looks at principles. They don't just quickly rush and say, so and so is an innovator. I don't like him. I didn't see him at our conference. He didn't get down with our program. He didn't sit with our group at lunch. So he's a mubtadiya. He didn't do this. He did that. Ahl Sunnah, they look, they make judgments on the vahir. Ahl Sunnah, they look at the evidence. Ahl Sunnah weighs things by the statements and, and, and deeds of people. <coughs> And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be from Ahl Sunnah, Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and bless us to have knowledge, and bless us to be just in a manner that pleases Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. The 14th and last criterion, it took longer than I thought, so we'll, we'll end after this. Ahl Sunnah to Jama'at love and behave very politely to one another, cooperating and preventing mutual uh, violence and mutual misunderstanding. They establish the status of friendship and enmity on the basis of Islamic law. So Ahl Sunnah uh, follows the principle which is from the ayat in which Allah Azza wa Jal says and cooperate all of you uh, in, in piety and in righteousness and do not cooperate in sinfulness and enmity you know and hatred and enmity so this is imper imperative that we understand this and we operate like this and on the sunnah they have love and they have mercy their mercy for mankind they should be a merciful people should run to Ahl sunnah for help they should run and race to, to want to be like Ahl sunnah if we were practicing properly and if we were greater in number <coughs> spreading our dawah but more importantly, practicing it ourselves. It's so easy for me to give this lecture with all my many, many shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and guide us. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. The people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah are the best among all people in conduct. This is how we're supposed to be. Those are the characteristics of Ahl Sunnah. They are most eager in purifying themselves. Those are characteristics of Ahl Sunnah. They're trying to purify themselves. Tarbiyah with Tesfi, as we mentioned. Obedience and submission to Allah. They're trying to stay away from sin. They're following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's taqwa. Uh, and most observant regarding universal theories and thoughts, keeping their hearts open at the time of differences or disputes. They are most knowledgeable of the manners and principles of tackling religious differences. So this is very important. Ahl Sunnah knows how to deal with those differences, you know, the, the, our, 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 our scholars. And their hearts are open. When there's a dispute between Ahl Sunnah, this is a characteristic which we need to work on. It's already a characteristic of Ahl Sunnah. And it's already a characteristic from those who are strong from Ahl Sunnah and from, from the ulama and so forth. But many of us, we don't know how to deal with differences. We don't know how to deal with disputes. Instead, we always make it us and then we make it, we turn it into Hizbiya. We turn a lot of issues that should not be issues into issues and into Hizbiya. Meaning that al wala wal bara. Oh, I saw you. You made a video with so and so. I saw you speaking to so and so. You know, I'm gonna excommunicate. I'm not gonna give you salams anymore. No, I'm gonna make hajar from you. I'm gonna make hajar from you and your family. I'm gonna make hajar from you and your community. You know, it it just goes way out of control because people don't know how to deal with disputes. It's not that people are more adherent to the principles because anyone can cut off the whole world and cut off people. That's easy to do. It's easy to think that you're on the Sunnah, but I'm saying that Ahl Sunnah will Jama'ah, according to what we see from the Book of the Law and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and what we learn from the Ulama, and when we go to these books, what do we find? We find that Ahl Sunnah is the most merciful. Ahl Sunnah is not quick to take people off the Sunnah. Ahl Sunnah is not quick to make Hizbiya around disputes, but they're looking to make Islah and deal with those issues based on the Book and the Sunnah with the guidance of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.